it's summertime. Yeah, well, I have a, I have a sermon about summertime. And so, yes, we're going to call it... John, it's not. It's not on. It's me. Wow. Okay. Now I'm on? Okay. That's good. Uh, so to back it up a little bit, I wanted to bring you a cautionary message about summertime. In summertime, we, we tend to let our guard down. In summertime, we tend to... Uh, Take our armor off, lower our shields, relax more. We're not as careful as we could be uh, when it comes to temptation and sin. And uh, Anna Marie, is your, is your baby here, your child here? He's gone? Okay, good. I can speak more freely then in the sermon. We need to be careful. This is a message about... This is a message about King David and Bathsheba and how he took a walk in a summer afternoon and it ruined his family. He took a walk. He wasn't where he was supposed to be and she probably wasn't where she was supposed to be, Bathsheba, and it ruined their, his family. So well, we're going to skip ahead right now on Wednesday nights, we're in 1 Samuel. But I want to skip ahead very quickly to a time of David. David, already 13 years as king. He was king 13 years. He let his guard down. We have to be careful. Sometimes routine is something that causes us to overly relax and let our guard down. Satan is alive and well. And we need to recognize he's looking for a way into your heart, into your life, in which it can ruin your heart. It can ruin your life and ruin your children's life as this walk he took on the roof, how it ruined all his children after that. All but Solomon. So I'm in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Something I, I do sometimes is I take the table of contents and I have my finger right there when the preacher says where to go to. I look it up very quickly and usually I beat everybody around me. So I say that because I want you to follow along in this 2 Samuel, chapter 11, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. Kings go forth to battle in the summertime. If they go anywhere else at any other time, they can get their, their chariots bogged down, their armies bogged down in, in uh the mud or the snow, depending on where it's at. He had been king for 13 years. And he's let his guard down. Be careful. Be careful when we get in a routine. We sometimes take for granted the fact that Satan is right there waiting for us to let our shield down. And it came to pass that after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab, his general, and his servants with him, and all the armies of Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon. By the way, the children of Ammon needed to be destroyed. They were very, very evil and torturous to the Israelites. And they besieged Ramah. Ramah was a city of Ammon, and uh, uh, it's amazing what they used to do, how they did it. If you, have a, if you have a castle, a fort, built up like this, where nobody can get in unless you let them in, they figure out a way. And, 
And what they will do is they will start way out here and start building a ramp right up to the edge of the fort so that then they can come in and capture. Oh, it might take two or three years, but that's what a siege often does. They starve you out, and uh, if they think you've got enough food to last them, they will, they, they will build the ramp. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. He used to go out on the he used to go out on the battlefield. He used to go out with the men and lead them. Now he's delegated everything to others, to Joab, uh, his his general, and he's staying home and taking his ease. And it came to pass in the evening. Time that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. Now, again, the king's house, it's like he's up here looking down on the city, looking down on the, on the he looked down and he saw a woman washing, taking a bath, washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the the woman. That was the first mistake. Remember, David's married. What's he doing asking about another woman? And it came to pass in the evening time that David got up out of bed, took a walk. Now, the sin is not seeing the woman. That's not the sin. David, verse 3, sent and inquired after the woman. And one of his servants said, This is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her. Now, now, uh, Uriah the Hittite is on the battlefield. He's been gone a long time. And again, ladies... Be very careful when, you're, when your man, your husband, uh, is out of state, out of, out of city, out of country for long periods of time. I, I don't know. Bonnie and I have had discussions about this. We don't want to put any blame on her yet. But she must have been lonely. I tell that story when I was first a youth pastor at my previous church, and I went to visit a a woman who had two teenage daughters. Her husband worked out of of town, and he came home to visit once a month, I think it was. And before I I knew it, the two daughters had, had evaporated somewhere else into the house, and I was left alone with this very lonely mother. And somehow, as I look back on it, I... She, she looked over at me on this couch and she put her hand on my leg and said, I'm so lonely. It was like electricity going through me. I jumped, by the way, ladies, never touch me in the thigh. It's very shocking. But I, I jumped up very quickly and I said, listen, I know you're lonely. I know, I know it's so hard. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find women in our church who can call you and comfort you and visit with you. And I have to go. And I ran, so to speak. We have to be so careful. Even Bathsheba, her husband had been gone probably for months. She's a very beautiful woman, used to getting a lot of attention and no husband. And the king calls her to his, his chamber. Verse 4. And David sent messengers. And he took her. She came in to him. And he. I'm changing the words. He was with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness. And then she returned to her house. This is the scriptures. It is inspired. 
This inspired record is to be regarded as divine light in the dark, warning us of the rocks upon which David's life was to be shipwrecked. He was the apple of God's eye. He was chosen of all of all the people in Israel to be king. God chosen to be king of Israel. But he still sinned. He still committed this sin. He's just more folk. He the, this uh, these things happened. David lost his family. If you know the stories, all his children were warped, grew up ungodly or at least, at least in terrible situations. One tried to kill him several times. Another one took advantage of his own sister and etc. His children grew up basically no morality. And it all started right here. We go back to verse 3 again. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And a servant said, This is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. She's married. She's married. But he had let this go into his eyes, into his heart. And he saw something he couldn't unsee. And again, I say this not just to the women. I say this, please be careful. In the summertime, clothes don't always get worn like they do in the wintertime. There's much, there's much exposure in the summertime. Please be careful. I say this before I, I get ahead of my message. My wife's not here. She's with the children, right? So I can say some of these things. I want to have eyes only for her. Your wife wants you to have eyes only for her. And I, I feel like I do. I feel like I do have eyes only for her because I, I try not to look even though I'm human. But so, so, so dangerous he changed his life. This is shown to us as a danger, blinking red light sing signal, warning us to be on guard, lest we, like King David, through, and here's the sin, the sin of unwatchfulness. When you let your guard down, you quit, you quit, you, you quit being careful. More than that on this in a minute. Some of us trust in their own heart and think they're not capable of sin. They're not capable of adultery, but it sneaks in like a thief, like a robber. Proverbs 28, 26, he that trusts in his own heart is a fool. Don't do it. Whosoever walks wisely, he will be delivered. Genesis 8, 21, where the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart, of the, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, the innards, even to give every man according to his own ways, according to his own, the fruit of his own doings. It was 1970, probably 1977. I was on the beach at Cocoa Beach, Florida. And uh, I was genuinely trying to live the life of a Christian. I'd been saved a couple years. I loved my Bible. I had stopped drinking completely. I was being very careful. I was without my wife for maybe six months at that point in the Navy. And now we're going to a beach and I wanted to enjoy it. So on the, I, park, uh, I, I parked my car. I don't know how I got a car. I parked my car. I bought one of those 
$5 styrofoam uh, ice coolers filled it with Pepsi in my Pepsi days. Me, the Lord, a blanket, and a nice chest of Pepsi in my Bible. We were going to go for a walk. We were going to go to the beach. And when we got there, I spread, I spread the blanket out. I had my Pepsis here. Had, as a matter of fact, I had this Bible with me. Huh. That's interesting. And I laid down on my stomach and I had my Bible right in front of me. And I, me and the Lord, we were really doing great. I was reading something that was phenomenal. I love reading the Word. But just then, a bikini walked by. And my head snapped up. No, no, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Forgive me, Lord, forgive me. Put my head back down in my Bible. Five minutes later, another bikini went by. My head snapped up. Oh, no, Lord, and I had to pull my head down. I covered my eyes like this, and I was reading my Bible. Remember, my wife is in Westchester, We'd been on maneuvers in the Caribbean. And we were there in Cocoa Beach for r and R. I couldn't stop raising my head. Okay. Okay, Lord, I understand. I packed everything up. Took it all the way back to the ship. Got in my bunk. Had a lot of Pepsi to drink. Got my favorite snacks. And me and the Lord had a had a time in my bunk. I remember that. Be careful. Summertime does that. Girls, be careful. Be careful for the way you, you might dress because society dresses that way. You might be causing some other man's, some other woman's husband to lust after you. Be careful. We'll get into that in just a second. I've gotten ahead of myself. The sin of unwatchfulness we're talking about. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Now, if you're somewhat new to the scriptures, the people that are in the Bible, the, the heroes in the Bible, they're not all perfect. I, even as I, I go through the scriptures, even in my mind's eye, I'm trying to find someone who lives somewhat of a perfect life. And uh, when, when we come to this, I, the Bible does not whitewash its heroes. They had to deal with the same temptations as we do. Noah was described as a preacher of righteousness Yet in Genesis 9, it speaks of his drunkenness. Abraham is described as a man of faith, yet he had his wife lie about her marriage to him so the opposing king wouldn't kill him, he thought. God would have protected him. Lot was supposedly a godly man who God spared from Sodom, yet his drunkenness led to untold sin too terrible to even speak of Aaron and Miriam are filled with jealousy and envy and speak evil against Moses their brother and here the apple of God's eye David David commits adultery and if you know the rest of the story when she comes up pregnant, he orders her husband to the very front lines to have him die. By the way, that baby died too. And David. Wow. Listen, all these heroes and us, we're just more folk and we're capable of anything they had let down their guard. They became guilty of the sin of unwatchfulness. There are times in our lives when we really need to be careful to watch the adulterous behavior of David. 
shows us that not only is the natural man fallen and depraved, but also the redeemed, the saved man, is liable and capable of the most terrible evil. This is true of all of us. I don't, I can't imagine having someone here, even in our Sunday night service, that is pure lily white with no sin. We're all capable. Whether it be even jealousy or envy, there's no one here that is perfect, no, not one. No one here that hasn't sinned, no, not one. We're all capable. The flesh in the believer is no different and no better than the flesh in the unbeliever. Think of that, please. All of us have a sensuality. All of us as born-again believers are called upon by God to are called upon by God to have our, our sensuality controlled. I say this for our youth even. I said it to a select group of people that stayed after this morning. Years ago, I was a youth pastor, a children's pastor. And I took the junior high youth group, probably about 30 of them, to Camp Manawagon. And uh, I'm giving a message. It was, it was in the winter, and I was giving them a message about sensuality. And I remember saying this. this will, I will never forget this. I said, and I say this to all of especially our youth, all of us have a candle. It's called our sensuality. God created us with it. It's not bad. It's good. But not all of us get our candle lit at the same age, the same time. Some of us get a little flicker. Some of us, I said, get a bonfire. Whatever it is, our candle, we need to be able to control it. Now, my son, afterwards, is giving a testimony. He and several of the youth group, and he stood up in front of everybody at camp, and he said, I just got to say this. Now, I think he was 14. and I, I just got to say this, he said. Girls... I'm a bonfire. You know what? It's okay. That wasn't sin. That he is a bonfire isn't sin. It's only a sin if he lets it blow up and gets out of control. So having said that, uh, it was very hard for me to, to, to minister the rest of the the week with my son saying it's a bonfire. And you know what? I was even talking to some of the youth group from years ago. And they said they remembered that when he said that. That's not something you forget. By the way, if you don't know, my son is a very godly man controlling his, his sensuality, very happily married with two children, a great pastor as well. But the flesh... And the believer is no different and no better than the flesh and the unbeliever. Yes, I was thinking about this, David. Let his guard down. The sin of unwatchfulness took a walk when he should have been on the battlefield. Okay, he saw a beautiful woman, poorly clad at least. David, the giant killer. You remember? He killed Goliath. The godly giant killer who had enjoyed such long and close communion with God. He wrote, he wrote much of Psalms. And some of it he wrote after he committed this sin with Bathsheba. He had enjoyed such a long and close communion with God. He'd been king for 13 years. But he still had the flesh with him. And because he failed to control the lust of the flesh, he threw away all the joys of divine fellowship with God, defiling his conscience and causing his children and their futures untold harm. 
all in exchange for the pleasures of sin for a season. The pleasures of sin for a season. The one who said, my soul thirsts for God, the living God, in Psalms 42, now finds himself thirsting after another man's wife. Don't let your guard down. So what happened to bring King David to this terrible sin? First, David got lazy. Physically and spiritually lazy. In verse 1, it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroy. David's failure was that he failed to follow the path of duty. Had he been fighting the battles of the Lord, he would not have been subjected to this terrible temptation. I have this picture. I have this picture of Satan being so involved in this. Hey, we've got this possibility, everybody. Let's get him on the roof. Let's get him Let's get him looking over the right side of the roof. Let's get this happening. Let's do this. And I think that Satan and his, his demons had a party after that. David had relaxed when he should have been on guard. He preferred the luxuries of the palace to the hardships of battle. He preferred comfort instead of hardship. The most important principle here for us Christians is this. Never commit the sin of unwatchfulness. Never let your guard down. Never take off your armor. We all have an armor that we are to wear. Please be careful. Be aware that your attire and your behavior affects other people. David had taken off his armor and was without protection when the enemy attacked him. Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So what happened to bring King David to this terrible sin? Number one, he got lazy. And especially, I started to say, and for the young, the young men, that is why you should start every morning in the Word of God, in, in a prayer life, giving, taking that moment so that you are acknowledging God as Savior and Lord of your life, spending time with Him. After he got lazy too, David had a wandering eye. Don't have a wandering eye. Be so careful with your eyes. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. It seems like some of us, not just some of us, but many of us in our society too are looking at the wrong things. Again, he saw a woman washing herself, and she was very beautiful to look upon. Here's a rule for life. We should never seek that which we cannot have without committing sin. We should never seek that which God wouldn't want us to seek. We should never seek anything that God would be that that God would be displeased with. And I think he notices. He notices when we exercise self-discipline. Isaiah 33, 15 says, It is the character of a good man that he shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He that walks righteously, righteously and speaks uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppressions, that shakes his hands from holding of bribes, 
that stops his ears from hearing of blood and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. I had to do that today. In an old, old movie that I used to love and uh, my wife watched it with me, Josie Wales or something like that. Clint Eastwood. I've seen it ten times, maybe more than that. That's a great story. But evidently this time it was the uncut version. And they snuck in there some nudity. I was appalled. I was shocked. I turned my head away and my wife is on the edge of her seat and now she's telling me when I can look. Don't look, don't look, don't look. Psalms 101 verse 3 is what we had in front of our TV growing up with my, my two teenagers. I will set no wicked thing. I just won't. I will not set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Psalms 101.3, very important. But it takes a committed person to do that. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the the work of those that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I want, to sit, I want to speak especially, I shouldn't say it this way, because I've had, I've had counselings with women who had this habit. But I want to speak especially to some that might have issues with pornography. My, my family member, not my immediate family, was addressed by his mother in our family and said, do you have any trouble with, with uh, pornography? And he turned to her. He was a sophomore or a junior in high school back east. And he turned to her, her and he said, Mom, that's all the boys look at on their phones at the bus stop. What? I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. It's a commitment. It's a promise that I will not. I just won't. So again, what were the actual steps to King David's fall? One, he looked, but that's not the sin. The sin is to keep on looking. Now, I happen to bring my binoculars. The sin is to keep on looking and to zero in and to stare. And that puts a germ of lust in our heart. By the way, don't lust for these. They're not very good. But the sin is to keep on looking and to stare at uh, the illicit person. He looked, and then he stared. Now, we've had it said here, and I've heard two different men in our church, and I've challenged them, but over the years, been here 21, 22 years, something like that, I've challenged them when a conversation came up like this, two of our, two, at least two of our men, and probably many more think it, you can look, but don't touch. You can look as long as you don't touch. That is a lie of the devil. And when you say that and others hear you, that's endorsing and giving them license to look. Don't look, especially if you're married or, go, or you're, you're in the dating cycle. Don't look. You can look, but don't touch. David sent and asked after her. David now has determined he wants to find out more. And David sent and inquired and found out that she was the wife of the Hittite. And I praise the Lord for those kind of friends and servants that would point that out to us. Here was a deliberate premeditation on David's part, but here too was a merciful warning from one of his servants. She's married. 
He was asking about Bathsheba, the wife of another man. And besides this, David is married. Now, I'm married and I claim, and some of you have argued with me and I'm grateful for that because every man should feel this way, but I'm married and I claim to be the happiest married man in the world ever. And wives, some of your husbands have argued with me about that. You ought to be proud of that. But I want to have eyes only for her. I want to have eyes only for her. And 1 Corinthians 7 talks about, shows that marriage was appointed as a remedy against loneliness and against fornication. Fornication is intimacy outside of your own marriage or before you're married, fornication. And therefore that persons had better to marry than burn. If they can't control the bonfire, they are, to, they are to get married. And wives, husbands, you are the remedy then. So what did David do? He sent messengers. He took her. She came to him. He laid with her. The order of events is very clear. First he saw her, he asked about her, and he laid with her we can get an even clearer picture of what happened when we look at James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Every man, that means every person, is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath Conceived, it brings forth sin. Conceived, planted in our hearts. And then it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. David was drawn away of his own lust. David was enticed with the sight of a beautiful woman. Then when lust has, has conceived, it brings forth sin. That of premeditated adultery... And soon after, the murder of her husband, Uriah. And after that, the children all developing immoral lives, godless lives, all but Solomon from this morning. I want you to remember the flesh of the believer is no different, no better than the flesh of the unbeliever. And again, some say you can look, but don't touch. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time. This is Jesus speaking. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Verse 28, But I say unto you, Whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. It's settled. No, you can't look as long as you don't touch. Jesus answered this 2,000 years ago. Again this, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, that is illicit sexual Activity with someone else when you're married or before you're married because you don't know your future and you're sinning against your future mate. That you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess, how to control his vessel, his body, and to control it in sanctification and honor. In this wonderful verse I found, it's like finding treasure. Job 31, 1. He says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Job married 
The only one that survived all those terrible things was his wife. He was married and they talked to him. His friends are trying to find out why all these bad things have happened to him. And the one must have said something about, you had an affair, didn't you? That's why God is doing all this to you. All your children are dead. Everything's gone. And he made that comment. I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think about a maid? Make a covenant with your eyes. Not just a promise. You might break a promise. Make a covenant to God that you will not, that you will not look upon a maid. That's not your maid. So we have the sin of unwatchfulness. In summertime, we let our guard down. We relax. We don't think anything can come of this. I just say this, you can't always get what you want. We need to have practicing this discipline of self-denial. As the musicians come, remember the sin is not to see, but to continue to see, to continue to stare. If you're married, you should have eyes only for her or him. And be careful how you dress. You're affecting a lot of people when you dress inappropriately. Lust builds fire in some people. It is possible, and I say this, I say this to our young women. It is possible that she just liked turning heads, dressing inappropriately. Don't get caught up in that, girls. Lord Jesus Christ, with all my heart, I pray for these. And that, Lord, you would season my words. Lord, I've said some hard things. I pray, dear Lord, you will season them, soften them. So I haven't been too blunt. But, Lord, it might be necessary for me to be this blunt about the sins of summertime. Protect us, Lord. Protect our eyes from seeing evil. Protect our hearts for from lusting after things we're not to have. Thank you, Lord. In times like these, it is so hard, so difficult, when it is so easy, easier ever in the history of the world to commit these type of sins. In Jesus' name, amen.